Today we are going to the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to Egypt. Raya and Sakina Ali Hamam were born in a remote village in Upper Egypt. Raya was the eldest, having been born in 1875, and her sister was born 10 years later in 1885. They lived with their mother and brother, as at a very early age, they had been abandoned by their father. Life was not easy for the family. They lived in poor conditions, and Raya and Sakina's mother would usually send her two daughters out to sell roasted vegetables in order to try and make a little money. Their mother was known to be quite an eccentric lady who seemed to show very little affection towards her children. The family moved around quite a bit, but they eventually settled in the village of Kafa al Zayat, which was in the Nile Delta. The sisters stayed in the village until they were married, but married life didn't improve their conditions. Sakina and her husband divorced, and she left the village and went to live in the large city of Tanta, which is 95 kilometers north of Egypt's capital city, Cairo. Here she met Mohammed Abdelal, and together they went to live in Alexandria, settling in the Azarita district. Raya and her husband Hasbollah stayed in the village, but Hasbollah was a thief and a smuggler and was often in trouble with the authorities. So when the opportunity arose, they left and went to Alexandria to live with Sakina and her husband. In 1913, Alexandria was known as a very cosmopolitan city located on the banks of the Mediterranean Sea. Its boulevards, cafes and shops rivaled the great French coastal cities of Nice and Marseille. It was a home to many rich families and was a very important trading post for the country. Things, however, started to decline in 1914 following the outbreak of World War I. The Egyptian economy inevitably suffered and as it became harder to export cotton, the large cotton manufacturers started to lay off their staff. This greatly affected Raya and Sakina, as both their husbands worked in the cotton industry. They were now left with no one working in their house and unable to generate an income. The two sisters, however, were very resourceful. They came up with the idea of opening a house where people could come to indulge their vices. They opened their first one close to the British Army base and it became known locally as the camp. Business was good and as well as being frequently visited by the soldiers, it was also used by local businessmen as well as married men and women who wanted some time away from their spouses. As more British soldiers arrived in the city, the sisters opened four additional establishments in different parts of Alexandria. It was presumed that prostitutes operated from each of them, but prostitution was illegal in Egypt and the sisters always denied that they offered any such service, insisting that they prohibited any sort of immoral behaviour. However, to avoid problems with the neighbours or other people who disapproved of what they were doing, they employed the protection services of two local men named Arabi and Abdul Razik. For the first time in their lives, they were prospering. But in 1918, World War I ended and many British troops left Egypt. The sisters' fortunes started to change. Egypt was a British protectorate, but the country pushed for independence. In March 1919, there was a popular uprising against the British, which resulted in strikes and a general curfew. The economy started to suffer, as did the business that Raya and Sakina had spent the previous five years building up. Suddenly, they found themselves in a very poor economic situation and resorted to stealing food just to get by. Hasbullah was caught and sent to jail. Then Raya was caught and spent six months in prison. Raya and Sakina had a hard upbringing, and after experiencing a more prosperous lifestyle, they did not want to return to the hand-to-mouth existence that they had tried so hard to escape from. They had seen how the wealthy families lived in Alexandria and wanted to experience that way of life. But in order to achieve it, they would need a way of making money. And with the country in an economic depression, that was not going to be easy. 
At the time, Alexandria's elite, especially the women, did not deposit their money in a bank. Instead, they would buy gold jewellery and wear it, mainly on their neck, arms and ankles. Rhea and Sakina came up with a plan to rob the jewellery from the unsuspecting ladies and then sell the items to a friendly jeweller. They decided that the best place to find a suitably jewel-laden lady would be at the market. So together they would go there, and when they had identified the woman wearing the most jewellery, Rhea would approach her and try to strike up a pleasant conversation. If she found her to be responsive, she would quietly tell her that she had come into the possession of some items from the custom zone, which she had for sale at a very cheap price. She would then invite the lady back to her house, which was located in the Laban neighbourhood of the city. Some of the ladies that Rhea would talk to were already acquainted with the sisters, and some even considered them to be friends. Once they were inside the house, Rhea and Sakina would offer the lady alcohol, and they would continue their conversation. Then, when the victim was a little drunk, the sisters' husbands would enter the room, and the four of them would suffocate the unsuspecting victim. They would then take all the jewellery and bury the body underneath their house. Between November 1919 and November 1920, worried residents of the city would continually contact the police, asking them to investigate the disappearance of their missing relatives. It was hard for the police, as although the women were missing, there were no bodies, so the women could just have gone away. But whenever they investigated a case, witnesses would often remember that at the time of the disappearance, they were seen in the company of Rhea and Sakina. Eventually, the police arrested the sisters and took them to the station for questioning. But with no evidence and the sisters denying any knowledge of the missing women, they had no option other to let them go. In December 1920, a police officer walking along the streets of Alexandria discovered human remains on the side of the road, near to the sister's home. The dismembered body was unrecognisable, except for its long braided black hair. In the same month, a landlord of a house that was previously rented by Sakina decided to install water pipes, and while waiting for the plumber to arrive, he started digging. Suddenly, he was overwhelmed by a powerful smell, so he reached into the hole trying to find out if anything was in it. He soon realised that the hole contained human remains. The police were called, and when carefully removing the tiles from the floor, they unearthed two decomposing bodies. They then paid a visit to Raya's house, which had a powerful smell of incense. When the police officer asked her why she continually burned incense, she said that it was because she still entertained customers there, and it covered the smell of alcohol and smoke. Her answer made the officer suspicious, and when he looked further around the house, he noticed that some of the floor tiles had recently been replaced. He went back to the police station and spoke to his superior officer. Soon after, a team of law enforcement officials returned to the house. They removed the newest tiles from the floor, and they were all very soon overcome by the unmistakable smell of decomposing bodies they found the remains of three women. The sisters and their husbands were arrested. They were taken to the police station and interrogated. The younger of the two sisters, Sakina, continually denied that she knew anything about the bodies under the floor of the house. Rhea, however, soon confessed. The police commissioner then ordered that all of the houses that Rhea and Sakina had previously rented and lived in be searched. They discovered a total of 17 bodies hidden underneath the floors. Ten were later identified, but the remaining seven were considered unidentifiable. The investigation continued, and the sisters blamed each other for their dark deeds. But the police found a very credible witness in Rhea's young daughter named Badia. She told them how she often watched her parents commit the crimes through a small crack in the wall at her home. Rhea and Sakina and their husbands Hasbollah and Abdelal were all charged with murder. The news of the crime soon spread throughout Egypt. Crime was by no means rare in the country at the time, but this one seemed to exceed anything that had previously been reported. Before the trial, 
the newspapers filled their pages with opinions as to whether a woman would or should be condemned to death as no woman had previously received the death penalty in Egypt. The courts, however, confirmed that a woman found guilty of such a ghastly crime could indeed be sentenced to death. The trial started on May the 10th, 1921. The prosecution outlined the crimes to the courts and produced many witnesses who had seen the victims with the sisters shortly before they disappeared. The defence's case was very weak and six of their nine witnesses decided against testifying. The defence of the sisters came down to both of them blaming each other. After three days of testimony, the trial ended and the sisters and their husbands were all found guilty of murder and the court retired to consider the sentence. Four days later, on the 16th of May, the chief magistrate sentenced Rhea and Sakina, along with their husbands, to death. He gave the same sentence to the sisters' two bodyguards, Orabi and Abdul Razik. The jeweller who had purchased all of the stolen jewellery was sentenced to five years in prison. On December the 21st, 1921, Rhea and Sakina were hanged to become the first women to be executed by the state in Egypt. The following day, their husbands met the same fate. Death did not end there, however, as when Rhea was arrested, the authorities placed her daughter Badir in a hostel. Three years later, a fire broke out and Badir tragically died. Many believe that the fire was started by a relative of one of his sister's victims. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next Brief Case 